If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm joined by our Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here. Thank you, Larry. And Steve, you've done quite a bit of research into the religion of Islam. Uh, so much research that we've done countless shows now, I'm losing count, of all the shows we've done on Islam, uh, comparing the religion of Islam, the Muslim religion, with Christianity, and then also... Uh, exposing to the public many of the teachings, the little-known teachings mm -hmm. of Islam from their authoritative sources, the Quran and their Hadiths, which are particularly are held in revered fashion by the Sunni Muslims. The Shiites and some of the other uh, uh, sects of Islam don't quite hold the same value on the Hadiths, but, mm -hmm. but we've gone into all that in detail. But uh, we're going to continue in our uh, analysis of Islam since there are over one billion people in the world out there that believe in Islam in one shape or fashion. And so therefore it's been worthy of our time to put this, this effort into it just because there are so many people either that are into the religion or have relatives or other friends or whatever that are tied into it. So we've taken the time to do an extensive array of videos on this subject. And today's subject, dealing with Islam, is going to be kind of an interesting one, I think. Uh, it should be most revealing, giving you a, a side of Islam maybe you've never looked at before. But the title of today's program is, Did Muhammad Marry a Nine-Year-Old Girl? And uh, Steve, uh, without further delay, because I think we have plenty of research material we have to look into to answer this question. So we're going to need every last second we've got. Mm -hmm to try to get into this program. Uh, the question is, did Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, the one who supposedly got his revelations from the angel Gabriel, and that's how the Quran eventually got to us, and then you've got all these hadiths that talk, tell us about the prophet Muhammad. Did, did the prophet of Islam, Allah's apostle, Muhammad, did he marry a nine-year-old girl? Now, with that, I'd like you with all the extensive research we have at our disposal to answer that question for our viewers. Okay. Actually, she was six years old when Muhammad married her, but he consummated the marriage when she was eight or nine years old. So uh, for our viewers who were concerned that the Prophet of Islam had married a nine-year-old girl, that is not true. Uh, te technically, yet he married she, a she's nine, even he younger. Married a, he married a six-year-old instead. Yeah, and he was 53 at the time. And he was a 53-year-old man right. marrying a six-year-old girl. Right. And uh, the name of this six-year-old girl was Aisha. Right. The Prophet Muhammad has 17 or more wives and concubines. And of all these 17 wives or concubines or more, uh, would you say that Aisha, the six-year-old girl that he married when he was 53, uh, was she considered to be, as time went on, his favorite wife of all these wives? Uh, most definitely. Most definitely. So he liked this little girl who grew, got older as time went on, but she rated as his favorite wife. Right. She, she was actually younger than his daughter. Younger than his daughter. Yeah, Fatima what it, what it was his daughter, and she was maybe 10 years younger than her. So, But he always considered Aisha, this young six-year-old girl who grew up, obviously, but to be his favorite. Right. She was about 19 when he died or something. Okay. So he was married to her for about 13 years then. Yeah. Okay. Now, with this set on the table, uh, the question in the title of the show is, did Muhammad marry a nine-year-old girl? We kind of answered that in, in partial, but now we want to get into it in detail. So with that, go ahead and establish the show, Steve, and, and get us going on this whole subject. 
Okay, so uh, most Muslims will agree, uh, most Muslim scholars at least will agree that, that Muhammad uh, consummated his marriage with Aisha when she was eight or nine years old. Uh, however, there are some Muslims who, many, some Muslims haven't heard of that, uh, and some Muslims will deny it. And uh, now, if we were to say that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, that's a pretty serious charge to make against Muhammad, and we wouldn't expect you to believe it unless we had live documentation. So we're going to provide the evidence that he did that. We're also going to show some of the objections that people who deny it bring up, and then we're going to answer uh, those objections. And then we're going to finally say, well, well what, what does this all, all mean about Islam? Uh, but, uh, but before we get into that, well, we want to establish why this is relevant in our world today. Because there's a very important uh, practice that's often overlooked, especially in the West, and that is the, the, the child brides in Muslim lands due to Muhammad's example. Uh, in, uh, in uh, Iran, as of June 2002, it's illegal for a nine-year-old girl to marry. She has to have her parents' permission, but she can do that. This is according to Voices Behind the Veil, page 136 and 137. In the Ivory Coast, the same book also tells of a 12-year-old girl who would leave the house for hours before returning home, and her father didn't like that. And at various times, her father tied her up, burned her back with a piece of iron, locked her up for three days with no food, and he eventually married her to a 40-year-old man. He's, he never sent her to school because he said it would dry, school would drive them from tradition, and they'd start asking questions, and they would not want to marry until they're 19 or 20. The Taliban encouraged families to marry off their daughters as young as 8 years old, according to Voices Behind the Veil, page 110. Very sadly, the Dallas Morning News in 92803, page uh, 1 and 10S, had a, had a very sad story about the plight of Muslim Nigerian girls who were married very young, and they got pregnant and had labor before their small bodies were ready. It was actually kind of a gross story, uh, because it, basically many girls who needed C-sections didn't get a C-section and they were not able to have children for the rest of their life. So, to understand the authority of nature and the example of Muhammad, we have to understand something of the Muslim Hadiths. They hold a higher place in Sunni Islam than, let's say, church tradition does in the Greek Orthodox Church or, or, or in the Catholic Church. There are lots of Hadiths that were written, many of them are considered forgeries, but there are six authoritative collections where people sifted through these Hadiths and they accept these Hadiths. Maybe not as without any error, but as, uh, but as generally very truthful. And um, so we're going to quote from these six Hadiths, plus we'll have a few quotes from uh, uh, early Muslim historians, uh, Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari. So starting off with the highest hadith, uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, and al-Bukhari collected these, and he lived about uh, 810 to 870 A.D., uh, which he died about 256 years, you know, after Muhammad started his migration, you know, um, to Medina. And anyway, the first quote is, narrated Hisham's father, Kajija died three years before the, depart the prophet departed to Medina. He stayed there for two years or so, and then he married Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age, and he consummated that marriage when she was nine years old. This is according to Bukhari, uh, volume 5, uh, 236, page 153. The same points, I won't repeat it, are in Bukhari 5, 234, page 152. A third uh, reference is narrated Ura. The prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old and she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. Bukhari 7, uh, 88, page 65. So actually from the time that he consummated the marriage, he lived about nine more years. And so he actually was, it was like, you know, 12 years when they got married. Okay? And so uh, the next one is narrated Aisha. The prophet was screening me with his rita, that's a garment covering the upper part of the body, while well, I was looking at the Ethiopians who were playing in the courtyard of the mosque. I continued watching till I was satisfied. So you may deduce from this event how a little girl, who has not yet reached the age of puberty, who is eager to enjoy amusement, should be treated in this respect. This is in Bukhari 7, uh, 163. So this is like uh, after, just prior to, or right at the marriage uh, with, with Muhammad. Okay? But... Uh, Besides looking at, at this, you can actually look at the Bukhari Hadith online um, at uh, the, the website www.cwis.usc.edu slash DEPT slash MSA slash fundamentals slash Hadith Sunnah slash Bukhari. And, but, or you can get the, the paper copy of Bukhari, the nine volumes you can see in the light volumes behind me. Uh, those are in both Arabic and English. 
Sahih Muslim uh, was compiled by uh, Imam Muslim from 817 to 875 AD, and he died at 261 uh, after Hajira. And this is considered the second most reliable of the Hadiths. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her reported, Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, married me when I was six years old, and I was admitted to his house at the age of nine. She further said, We went to Medina, and I had an attack of fever for a month, and my hair had come down to the earlobes. Um Ruman, my mother, came to me, and I was at that time on a swing, along with my playmates. She called me loudly, and I went to her, and I did not know what she wanted of me. She took hold of my hand and took me to the door, and I was saying, Ha ha, as if I was gasping, until the agitation of my heart was over. She took me to a house where had gathered the woman of the Ansar. They all blessed me and wished me good luck and said, May you have shared in good. She and my mother entrusted me to them. They washed my head and embellished me, and nothing frightened me. Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, came there in the morning, and I was entrusted to him. This is Sahih Muslim, uh, Volume 2, 3309, page 715 to 716. Also in Sahih Muslim, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her reported, Allah's apostle, my peace be upon him, married me when I was six years old, and I was a minister of his house when I was nine years old. Aisha, Allah be pleased with her reported, that Allah's apostle, my peace be upon him, married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine. And her dolls were with her, and when he, the Holy Prophet, died, she was 18 years old. Sahih Muslim 2, 3310-3311, page 716. Okay, so you're getting the story. It's a very consistent story here. Uh, also, a, an, another one that he found. Aisha reported that she used to play with dolls in the presence of Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him. And when her playmates came to her, they left the house because they felt shy of Allah's messenger, whereas Allah's messenger sent them to her. And also, this hadith has been narrated on the authority of Hisham with the same chain of transmitters with a slight variation of wording. Sahih Muslim 4, uh, 5981 and 5982, page 1299. So the conclusion is we have all, all these four references and no counterexamples show that Aisha was nine, and she was married when she was six, or one place married when she was seven. Okay? And there's no doubt, about, no doubt about it because it's authoritative Sunni Muslim hadith that they themselves selves wrote. This isn't some forgery that somebody else came in and put in here. This is what the Muslims themselves have, have put forward right. as evidence. And uh, also in Sunan Abu Dawud, 817 to 888 or 889 is when he lived, which means he died 270 years after Hajira. It's Aisha said, The Apostle of Allah married me when I was seven years old. And the narrator Suleiman said, Or six years. He had intercourse with me when I was nine years old. In Abu Dawud 2, 2116, page 569. Or another reference in Abu Dawud, Aisha said, I used to play with dolls. Sometimes the apostle of Allah, may peace be upon him, entered upon me when the girls were with me. When he came in, they went out. When he went out, they came in. Sunan Abu Dawud 3, 4913, page 1373. So this isn't saying that Muhammad had sex with Aisha when the other girls were around. But what it is saying is she would play with the dolls or play with her other little playmates, and then they and then he would come in and they would leave and he would have sex with her and then he'd leave and they'd come back and play with dolls or whatever again. Kind of different uh, morals here. It kind of reminds me of a of a situation where if we we're in American culture and we're looking at a, a playground, there's lots of daycare centers everywhere. I've you know I've had four kids and I had them all. Because my wife and me were working, we had to put our kids in daycare now. And it was, you almost get the idea that, you know, when you go to pick up your kid at a daycare, that all the kids are in a playground there or whatever. Sometimes they're in there at nap time or whatever. But there's just lots of kids. And I almost get this idea of, like, a guy comes into the daycare where all the kids are. And then all the little kids, they see the guy come in. And they all leave except the one who's there to be the sexual object. Mm -hmm. he does his thing and then he leaves to take care uh, of all the children and then the then after he leaves and the kids come back into the daycare it's like that's a, the idea i'm almost getting in my mind as you're reading these 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 uh muslim hadiths and then, yeah and 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 for this in our modern american minds to visualize something like this it, it you know it, it's almost beyond belief it almost sounds like hey if a guy did that in our culture he'd get arrested yeah. Now, 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 bear in mind, these are not some obscure esoteric teachings. These are um, almost sacred, sacred scripture in Islam. They are the highest authority in all Sunni Islam after the Quran. Right. So, and 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 and, these, and, and uh, many Muslims uh, read and study these, uh, memorize some of the hadiths, and this is you, you know it, uh, 
this is religious literature. So I'm wondering what our viewers would think if they had their kid at a daycare and a guy comes in and does something like that. It, well, it, it would seem totally wrong in in our culture and yeah. in society. And so, uh, well, well, Muhammad like legitimized it by you know being married to her. But. Right, but still, you know, it, even being married to a six year old child would seem to strike, I think, our culture at least, funny. But anyway, let's go on yeah. with this. Okay, so, so, so another one, and there are going to be some Muslim objections to this, so that's why we want to go in such detail on the documentation on this. Aisha said, The Apostle of Allah, may peace be upon him, married me when I was seven or six. When we came to Medina, some women came, according to Bishra's version. Um Ruman came to me when I was swinging. They took me, made me, uh, prepared, and decorated me. I was then brought to the Apostle of Allah, may peace be upon him, and he took up cohabitation with me when I was nine. She halted me at the door, and I burst into laughter. Abu Dawud said, That is, I menstruated, and I was brought in a house, and there were some women of the Ansari helpers in it. They said, With good luck and blessing. The tradition of one of them has been included in the other. So in other words, it just starts after she started having her period that uh, Muhammad started cohabitating with her. Okay, so. and, and, and it couldn't be more clear. I mean, yeah. the viewers at home can read it. The documentation is there. So yeah. I, I have trouble with you know, anyone... Not clearly understanding what they're saying. Yeah. And, and to deny it is to deny the actual Muslim Hadith. But anyway, go on. All right, well, and again, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi, in, in 49.16, now I should say that the English translation has 59.16, but that's actually a typo. Uh, it says, The tradition above has also been transmitted by Abu Usama in a similar manner through a different chain of narrators. This version has with good fortune. So, slight difference in wording, really no big difference there. She, Um Ruman, entrusted me to them. They washed my head and redressed me. No one came to me suddenly except the Apostle of Allah, may peace be upon him in the forenoon. So they entrusted me to him. And uh, Aisha said, When we came to Medina, the woman came to me while I was playing on the swing, and my hair were up to my ears. They brought me, prepared me, and decorated me. Then they brought me to the Apostle of Allah, may peace be upon him, and he took up cohabitation with me when I was nine. Uh, and that was uh, 4917 in Abu Dhabi. 4918. The tradition above has also been tr transmitted by Hisham B. Urwa through a different chain of transmitters. This version adds, I was swinging, I had my friends. They brought me to a house, and there were some women with the Ansar helpers, and they said, with good luck and blessing. And then finally, 49.19, Aisha said, We came to Medina and stayed with Banu al-Harith being al-Khajraj. She said, I swear by Allah, I was swinging between two date palms. Then my mother came and made me come down. I had my hair up to the ears. Then the transmitter transmitted the rest of the tradition. And so you can see all these on page 1374 in Abu Dhabi. So there are all these references, you know, Abu Dhabi's pretty clear. Uh, the next most authoritative hadith at Termiti, or Termiti, um, I have to not comment on because I don't have a copy of that in English, so there was nothing on there that I could check out. The next one after that, Sunan Nasai, who lived uh, 830 to 915 AD, and that means 215 to 303 AH, you know, after Hajira, is then Hadrat. Hadrat uh, roughly means like holy. Uh, a term for the companions of, of, of Muhammad. Then Hadra Aisha passed nine years of married life. The, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of, of Allah be upon him, fell in mortal sickness. On the ninth or twelfth, the Rabb al Awal, 11 AH, he left this moral world. And dot, dot, dot. Hadra Aisha was 18 years of age at the time when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, passed away. And she remained a widow for 48 years till she died at the age of 67. Soon on Nasai 1, number 18, page 108. Uh, so if she was 18 when he died, and she was married to him for, for nine years, then she consummated the marriage when she was nine. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the conclusion, you know, it's, it's the same as everything else. Ibn Imaja, the last one on the Hadith, uh, has a couple of things. Aisha was married when she was six years old, and nine when she went to Muhammad's house, uh, is a paraphrase of Ibn Imaja 3, 1876, page 133. Aisha was married at seven, went to Muhammad's house at nine, was 18 when Muhammad died. Okay, now the other verse said 19, so maybe off by a year. That's easy to do. And according to al Zawaid, it's Isnad is Sahih, according to the condition of Bukhari. However, Abu Ubaidah did not hear from his father, so does Munkata. Munkata means it's a tradition that would be sound, but it has a gap in it. That's in Ibn Majah 3, 1877, page 134. Okay, so let's leave the Hadiths now and look at some, what the earliest, uh, some of the earliest Muslim historians said. Ibn Ishaq was earlier than most of these Hadiths. He died either 767 or 773 A.D., we're not sure, which is 145 or 151 A.H. And he said that Yahya is roughly equivalent to John, by the way. Yahya bin Abad bin Abdullah bin al-Zabir, from his father, told me that he heard Aisha say, 
The apostle died in my bosom during my term. I had wronged none in regard to him. It was due to my ignorance and extreme youth that the apostle died in my arms. This is from Alfred Gayam, the, the Life of Muhammad, uh, which is a translation of Ibn Ishraq's Surat Rasul Allah. You notice that Aisha said she was an extreme youth when Muhammad died. Okay, so now let's look at Al-Tabari. And uh, Aisha was six or seven, that's in Al-Tabari, years old when she was married, and the marriage was consummated when she was nine years old. This is Al-Tabari, volume nine, uh, page 129 and 131. Uh, Muhammad bin Amir is one of the transmitters on that. Aisha was six or seven when married, and came the marriage was consummated when she was nine to ten, three months after coming to Mecca. This is Al-Tabari, volume seven, page seven. And the chain of transmission includes an unnamed man from the Quraysh. So if the chain of transmission includes somebody that they don't have a name of, then that kind of weakens it. Okay, on the other hand, and here is a counterexample that contradicts the other things Tabari says. Al-Tabari also wrote uh, that all four of his, meaning Abu Bakr's children, were born of his two wives, the names of whom we have already mentioned, during the pre-Islamic period. Okay, and this is Al-Tabari, volume 4, page 50, and uh, this uh, was taken from a... Uh, a Muslim brought this up in Arabic. And so a footnote says that Al-Tabari does have a conflict here. So if Abu Bakr was one of the first converts to Islam, but if Aisha was born prior to that, then that would sort of make her a teenager instead of nine or 10. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's something contradicting this in Bukhari, which is considered more reliable than Al-Tabari. And in, in Bukhari, it says, narrated Aisha, the wife of the prophet, I never remembered my parents believing in any religion other than the true religion, i.e. Islam. And I don't remember a single day passing without our being visited by Allah's apostle in the morning and in the evening. That's Bukhari 5, 245, page 158. Thus Aisha was either not very old or not born yet when her parents became Muslims. So this is inconsistent. Uh, Al-Tabari's last quote is inconsistent with Al-Tabari's other quotes, inconsistent with Bukhari, and inconsistent with everything else. Okay. So anyway, what do Muslims say about this? Well, there are, are two basic uh, answers. One answer is, yes, uh, it's okay to have sex with a nine-year-old because uh, Muhammad did. And there are uh, a couple of websites that, that we ha have up that you can r read at. And uh, in corresponding to one Muslim uh, woman, she said, yeah, and I bet Aisha was the happiest nine-year-old around. <laughs> so they, they accept that. And, they, and in Muslim countries today, they follow Muhammad's example. Okay. There is another minority Muslim viewpoint. Most Muslim scholars hold the majority viewpoint, but the minority viewpoint says that this did not happen. Okay, so let's look at the reasons for saying this, um, that, and, and then we'll come to our own conclusions. Okay, the first reason is there are doubts on three of the transmitters. In particular, a nun named Man of the Quraysh in Al Tabari, volume 7, page 7, that's kind of a weak reference. Also, Hisham bin Urwa is a transmitter of those references, and if he were mistaken, then all the people who accurately quoted him would have wrong information. All right, furthermore, uh, Muzanul I Tidal, I'm sorry if I mess up the pronunciation, it's, called, it's a book on the life of the narrator's tradition of the prophet, reports that when he was old, Hisham's memory suffered quite badly. And Tezabul Tezib is one of the most well-known books on the life and reliability of the narrators of the traditions of the prophets, and he re reports that according to Yaakov, Yaakov kind of corresponds to Jacob, by the way, Yaakov ben Shebai, narratives reported by Hisham are reliable, except those who are reported through the people of Iraq. It further states that Malik ben Ana subjected on those narratives of Hisham which were reported on the people of Iraq. That's volume 11, page 48 to 51. A third transmitter, Muhammad ben Amr, is called weak, by Ibn Abu Hatim in al Jara wa Al-Tadil, uh, where he asked Yah about him, and Yah replied, he's not among those whom you desire to report from. Abu Hatim asked Malik and got a similar response. And Abu Hatim also says, Yah bin Muin says, people refrain from accepting his narr narratives. Also, Al-Dahabi uh, uh, says that Muhammad bin Amir is not strong, meaning not reliable, and Ukulai also said Muhammad bin Amir was weak. So with references becoming weak, what does that mean? Well, you can see in the PowerPoint there's kind of a scorecard where uh, I've, I've marked off as weak references all the references by uh, either the unnamed Quraysh or Muhammad bin Amir or Hisham. And what we find out is there are 15 references that are still strong and there are seven references that are weak and there's one reference, the, the counter-reference, that says different in Al-Tabari. Seven weak references do not 
detract from 15 strong ones. If anything, they add to 15 strong ones. So we have 15 strong references plus that all say that Aisha was 8 or 9 when um, her marriage was consummated. Okay, so let's look at the second objection. There are no other narrators from Medina. Hisham ibn Urwa lived in Medina for 70 years and then moved to Iraq. Why did no one else from Medina narrate that Aisha was eight or nine? Also, the other narrators are all from Iraq. The response to this Muslim objection number two is, this is an argument from silence. Many people did not report anything about Aisha's age of her consummated marriage. Also, Iraq would be a good source because both Aisha and many companions moved to Iraq by Uthman's time. Of course, we can assume Aisha remembered when she got married and told others. Well, Aisha, after Muhammad died, she moved to Iraq. And after she read, led a, a, a violent rebellion against Ali and was defeated, she had to go back to Mecca. So if there weren't many narrators from Medina, that's sort of understandable. Okay. Um, and if the other narrators, if some of them are from Iraq, that would actually be a, a positive point because she lived in Iraq. Okay, so you can't really do much with an argument from silence that they have. Okay, uh, one Muslim thought that uh, that he would knock this out because he said that uh, Arabs didn't have child marriages, and he said there was no child marriage in the history of the Arabs. Well, that's not true, even in uh, Islamic literature. And he's saying that if Muhammad did this, that'd be out of the ordinary, and you think a lot of people report it. But uh, if Muhammad didn't do this, then no one would really say anything. Okay. Well, uh, actually, in Bukhari 3, 831, page 514, it mentions a lady who became a, grand, a grandmother when she was 21 years old. That sure sounds like two child marriages to me. And this was not, this lady was unrelated to Muhammad, not one of his wives or anything. So if that's at least one reference to a child marriage, then obviously it was practiced. Finally, since no one objected to the reporting of this young marriage, even the majority of Muslim scholars hold that it did happen. Objection four is that Aisha said that she was a young girl when Surah 5446, which is an al kamar uh, and its topics on the splitting of the moon, was written. Okay, well, and one Muslim says, well, it was written nine years before Hijra, which means that, that she would have been um, you know, maybe a teenager when she married Muhammad. Well, one problem is that she said the word young girl is, is, is Jaria. And Jaria can mean young girl, it can mean a teenager, but it does not preclude use of somebody younger than a teenager. So it can mean teen or preteen. Okay? And that, you know, if you said it meant only teen, that contradict the, this one place would contradict many places where it said she only played, she played with dolls when she was married to Muhammad. Furthermore, it's possible if this is one isolated surah that it could have been the wrong surah, but I think that the real answer is that we don't know when surah 5446 was written. Um, for example, both Ibn Hajar and Madid said uh, surah 5446 was written five years before Hejra, not nine years before. So if Muslims themselves, if two Muslims say it was written five years before, one says it was written nine years before, you can't use nine years before as your solitary proof that Aisha wasn't really, um, you, you know, was older than that. Okay. Another objection Muslims have thought up is Aisha was at two battles: the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud, and uh, she was there to, you know, tend to the wounded and stuff. And it's also clear that um, that no boy b below the age of 15 was allowed to, to to fight in those battles. Well, that's a pretty easy answer. Aisha wasn't a boy. Aisha didn't fight in the battle. And any girl, uh, a girl was considered an, an adult when she reached puberty, which Aisha had, and so she was there, you know, tending to the wounded, you know, giving them water, helping with the wounds. So, you know, she wasn't a boy fighting, so that's not, you know, that's kind of grasping at straws there. Okay, finally, one a little bit more substantive is that Aisha's sister, Asma, was 10 years older than her, and she died when she was 100 in 73 AH. Okay. And uh, two books uh, uh, say this, um, and so if that was true, and if you do the math, um, that, w that, uh, that would make Aisha about 16 or 17, not 8 or 9. Okay. Well, the thing is, though, with a lot of older people, 
uh, when, after they die, people may not remember the exact year that, of how old they were. And so, you know, this kind of contradicts the many things to talk about her age and playing with dolls. So this is a bit of contradictory evidence, but, um, you know, it, it's like it's easy for somebody to be mistaken on this. Muhammad didn't say this. His companions didn't say this. It's people who were with Aisha's older sister said she was 100 when she died. Okay. Other objection we brought up, Abu Bakr said, um, uh, Al-Tabari said that Abu Bakr had four children, including Aisha, in the pre-Islamic period. Okay, well, Al-Tabari also said that Aisha was eight or nine when the marriage was consummated, and he didn't give an age of Aisha uh, before then. So he's contradicting himself here, and probably the, th the three strains of Al-Tabari that, that agree with everybody else are probably more likely to be correct than this one instance. Okay. Aisha accepted Islam uh, before Umar bin Qatab, according to Ibn Hisham. This is a different Hisham that we talked about before, by the way. Ibn Hisham in Surah al-Nabawiyah. Uh, this is volume 1, page 227, and, uh, and, and on. And she was a 20 or 24th person, while Umar was the 41st. One Muslim claimed this proves Aisha had to have accepted Islam during the first year, which would make her born earlier. Well, the problem is if this were accurate, then Aisha would be much older. She would be like in her 20s when she married him, and nobody claims that. Okay, however, since Umar became a Muslim just after the first migration to Ethiopia in 617, according to Ibn Ishaq, page 155-156, um, Aisha could have accepted Islam up to from 612 to 617 and still been before Umar. So the problem was the person who made this objection assumed a wrong age, I um, mean a wrong time for when Umar accepted Islam. So that, that, that would basically answer that. Al-Tabari says that eight years before Hejra, when Abu Bakr planned on migrating to Habja, Aisha was engaged to marry someone else named Mutam. Now if, now if Aisha was engaged to marry somebody else, this argument goes, then she had to be old enough to be a wife eight years before Hejra, which would make her you know, plenty old by the time that Muhammad took her to her house. But the problem with this, again, is it makes her too old. If this is true, why did Muhammad wait three years after marrying her before taking into her into a, her house? So this, again, is something where uh, Al-Tabari may have been wrong on a little detail, and someone uses it as the main argument, even though it contradicts the other details. Even if this objection account is accurate, Arabs both then and today often betrothed girls soon after they were born. Abu Bakr had other daughters, and it might have been one of them instead of Aisha. The tenth objection is according to Ahmed bin Habal, before she was married, she was called a bikr, B-I-K-R, okay, which means virgin or unmarried lady. Now, the, a Muslim argument is that, well, if she was a bicker, then she couldn't be a young girl. Okay, well, the trouble, people who speak Arabic will tell you that bicker means virgin, but it's not age-specific. So there's nothing in this Arabic word that prohibits her from being a young girl. And finally, the last objection that I've seen is that Ibn Hajar reported that Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, was born when Muhammad was 35 years old, that is when he was married to Khadija, which would make her five years older than Aisha. That would make Aisha 15 or 16 years old when they consummated their marriage. Okay. Well, the problem is this contradicts other hadiths that say Fatima was 29 years old when she died, six months after Muhammad, which makes her 10 years older than Aisha. And this is according to Sunan Nasai, Volume 1, number 29, page 115 and 116. So somebody forgot a date somewhere, but the authoritative uh, hadiths of Sunan Nasai generally be trusted more than Ibn Hajar. Okay, so these, uh, these uh, objections, which are in various forms, are given in more detail uh, on uh, various pages on the website, uh, www.answeringislam.org, which I would highly recommend that you would go to and read the, the arguments by various uh, Christian scholars and then uh, Muslims who try to answer them and then the Christians who, who respond back. So they had, you know, they had all these different objections, but none of them really held any weight. I mean, even if you knocked out a few translators, the scorecard still shows that, um, that the evidence is overwhelming. And this is not assuming that the Hadiths are from God. Uh, they're just assuming that the Hadiths are generally uh, historically reliable documents. So, all right. So now we have another question to ask is, what if the Hadiths are reliable here, like we're saying, and the majority of Muslim scholars say. 
okay, then that means Muhammad, when he was around 50 years old, had a sex with a nine-year-old girl, and by his example, that's why so many people are doing it today. And so the, the example of the prophet of the religion is obviously what followers of that religion, they want to emulate their prophet and do as their prophet does because mm -hmm. he's supposed to be the messenger of God. Right. The, 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 uh, basically the one that shows people how to live and how to act. So here you have a 53-year-old man having sex with a nine-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. And so since the prophet of God did that, obviously then you have in these Muslim countries, Middle Eastern countries or, or so forth, where Islam is predominant, right. then that would seem to be the rule that people would have no problem with. Right. Old men going to have sex with uh, girls that are under 10 years old. Right. Now, Muhammad didn't, com there's no command that they have to do that, but by giving them the permission, then, then, then that is common. And I just want, want to reiterate, we're not inventing something or making something up. All we're doing is reading religious literature and letting you draw your own conclusions. Right. Now, you have to wonder, you know, just from, there, there's so many religious and pseudo-religious people I deal with, you know, we both deal with as, as Christian evangelists. You know, I, I think of the book of Acts, chapter 17, where Paul's in Athens, and he says the whole city's holy, give it over to idolatry, and it's full of devout persons and and uh, and philosophers that know mm -hmm. everything, you know. And uh, But basically, the bottom line is the, all these types of people, given to the idolaters, the philosophers, and the devout persons, they're all against the, the true and living God. Uh, and, and the Apostle Paul has to try to show them, through preaching of the gospel, what the true and living God is teaching and in, 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 in how the, the actual God of all reality uh, expects us to live and how he expects us to, to act. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, you look at this uh, situation where you have uh, pseudo-intellectuals, philosophers, devout people that you know take bits and pieces of religion or just follow examples such as here you have Muhammad with the, you know having sex with a nine-year-old girl, uh, it's easy... For them to simply uh, accept that as the truth, right? Uh, based on just what the way they're brought up through their traditions of their family, if that's the way they were raised, their culture, and and not really look into uh, the overriding issues of of conscience, of what's right and wrong. And there's so many times I'm talking to people that don't really have any religious convictions, but yet you tell them like. Well, what's wrong with me taking your baby and sacrificing it to Satan in, in, in a microwave? You know, mm -hmm. Suddenly, people that have no real faith in a God or any confessed conviction in any, any, any particular religion, they'll, they'll tell you, oh, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, their conscience tells them that's wrong to take a baby or to come over to a neighbor's house and rape his wife or, mm -hmm. or steal his, his goods, his, you know, his possessions. They just... Whether they believe in the Ten Commandments or not, or Christianity or Islam, or anything, they just know in their conscience that certain things are just not right. Mm -hmm. And here you have a case of uh, of a fifty three year old fifty three year old man having sex with a nine year old girl, and, and a lot of people, no matter what their religious conviction is, they think that's just not right. You know, that just right. doesn't hit me right. Well, not not only not only is it bad from a moral perspective. But from a physical, medical perspective, uh, many girls, I mean, Aisha, uh, I guess, turned out all right. She never had children, but, 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 uh, but many girls, it's like their, their, their bodies aren't ready for it, and it causes permanent damage when they get pregnant. Right. And that's uh, another way that the Lord, the, the God of this universe that created it, is showing us that some things are not right. Because mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if it were okay, the women would not receive this permanent damage in their bodies. Right. Because the time is not right for them to be doing something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and yet here you have an example of the so-called prophet of God doing this act with a nine-year-old girl. And then, of course, the followers of that religion then start to emulate that, overriding their own conscience, which testifies that that's just not right. You shouldn't be doing that. But then because they're, they're believing this guy who claims to be a prophet, they, as the scripture talks about, they, they sear their own conscience mm -hmm. with a hot iron right. and, uh, and, and suppress the truth and unrighteousness, you might say, as Romans chapter 1 talks about. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so we have this this key example here of what's going on in 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 Islam. So as our viewers out there, as we talk about a 53 year old man having sex with a child, a nine year old in this case, most people, whether they have any religious knowledge or not, are going to say that's not right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Larry, what you're saying about searing their conscience and accepting anything that that people say Muhammad did, that's true for probably most Muslims. But I also need to point out that there is a, a significant minority of Muslims who would say, no way, who would say, this is wrong, but Muhammad didn't do it. And many of these would be the westernized Muslims, many of which right. who, who live in the United States. And so you can't say that Islam is one monolithic belief with everyone believing the same. There are many people who would deny this, and, they're basic and, and, and if these 11 objections don't work, um, then I've had Muslims tell me that the Hadiths are garbage or no more than 10% of what the Hadiths say it, it is true. And so there are liberal Muslims like this who, who would deny it. And we've talked on, in this video mainly about the conservative Muslims. Mm -hmm. but, but, but let's talk some about the liberal Muslims who say, uh, you know, maybe this is another objection to say, well, just throw out all the Hadiths, or at least mo most of the Hadiths. So what if Muhammad didn't do this after, a, after all? What if the modernist Muslims are right? And i got four questions for them. First of all, what does Sunni mean? if not that Muslims, the Muslim tradition of the Hadiths. You know, what is a Sunni Muslim? Well, my understanding is a Sunni Muslim is a Muslim who politically thinks that Abu Bakr and, um, and Umar and Uthman were rightful caliphs, unlike the Shiites, or most Shiites, and, uh, and also religiously who believes in the Sunnah or traditions in the Hadith are usually reliable, or at least that Allah did not give the traditions to lead people to do wrong things. Okay, so if you reject all the Hadiths, um, by any definition of Sunnah, you're not a Sunni Muslim. Okay, next question. Why, in your opinion, would Allah let the Hadiths warp Islamic society for over 1,200 years? Okay, considering what we've already said about the prevalence of child brides and the problem of that today in Nigeria and in, in, in many other Muslim places, um, and the medical horrors of that, um, why would Allah let that go on? They, they justify that based upon, you know, based upon Muhammad. Now, you would, if you're a liberal Muslim, you would say, well, that wasn't the real Muhammad. Okay, well, it's, at least it's the Muhammad of the Hadiths. And they justify that. Why would Allah let people follow, the, follow be misled by the Muhammad of the Hadiths? And, you know, if they're giving support to this practice. Now, Surah 354 says Allah is the best of schemers, or it can be translated schemers or deceivers. You know, was this a deception of Allah? You know, surely not. You know, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't think it's a deception of the true God. Is this um, child bride practice and some of these other uh, kind of uh, barbaric practices with, with the Hadith, uh, is that a deception of Satan? Was it, not a, was it, not, a, was it a, not a scheme at all? If not, then why would people doing the, be doing this and why would God permit this if this was false? Okay, also, according to Islam, do you know what happens to people who follow the wrong sect? Okay, according to some Hadith, Muslim who was split up into 73, or in some cases 72 sects, and it clearly says they will all go to hell except one. And the documentation on this is Abu Dawud 3, 4579 to 4580, page 1290 to 1291. Also, Ibn Imaja 5, 3992, page 312. The Quran also speaks against those who split up and become sects in Surah 3032. If the Hadiths are wrong on this point and they're evil in supporting this horrible practice, if you are a Sunni Muslim, you're in the wrong sect. You know, that the very Sunniness, if I can coin a new word, a Sunni mm -hmm. Islam, has misled people horribly and condemns Muslims who are in a misleading sect. And if people found themselves in a the wrong sect, then if they want to please God, shouldn't they change and leave that sect? And finally, the last question is, might the correct path be something you didn't expect? If Sunni Islam were the wrong sect and the consequences of following as bad examples are severe, is it possible that the right path might not be called Islam? Questions for traditional Muslims only. Everyone has to agree that the Hadith and the vast bulk of Islamic scholarship, both in the past and present, teach that Muhammad had sex with a young eight- or nine-year-old girl. Here are four questions, but these questions are only for Muslims who teach that the Islamic Hadith 
are reliable. So going back for the traditional Muslims, if uh, why do many Muslim teachers say that Sharia is good and yet they don't teach this part, they cover it up? And also, if you say that Muhammad is sinless, does that mean that Muhammad really never did anything wrong? Or does that mean that anything Muhammad did, you will define it as, as, as not being wrong? Is there anything that Muhammad could have done, rape or, or, or sexual slave girls or anything else, that you would say was wrong even if Muhammad did it? And also, why do you think that so many westernized Muslims and, and modern Muslims, they don't follow the teaching of Hadith? Do they maybe see something that maybe you don't? And also, if, if you're a conservative Muslim who tells people they need to follow Hadith, and you have still or moving pictures of people in your home, including TV set, or you wear clothes and yet they're yellow and are man, or if you, um, have you read what the things in the Quran and Hadith say about hypocrites? For example, uh, for banning all pictures, uh, Bukhari 3, 318, page 180, uh, 447, 450, and a whole bunch of other uh, references all show that you can't have pictures in your house. And that includes still pictures like photographs, includes moving pictures. And then the footnotes, uh, such as in Abu Dhabi on page 1373, you know, clearly say that, that that means that too. So the conclusion is, if, if, for, for a Muslim, if he wants to pay attention to a traditionalist, don't do so unless you find a consistent traditionalist. But if you cannot find a consistent traditionalist, then, well, maybe you shouldn't be following that. If you are a Sunni Muslim and you do not follow or believe all of the Islamic laws found in the Hadith, then you are not really a Sunni Muslim and are condemned to hell as being part of a false Islamic sect. In effect, you have deceived yourself, and Allah will judge you on the last day. And then again, for uh, Muslims who are maybe claiming to be Sunni, but they aren't really Sunni because they don't follow traditions, again, you know, if you're not a Sunni, you, know, you should at least say you're not a Sunni. And how do you handle Allah deceiving his followers, or at least allow them to be deceived, by this evil, what you believe to be an evil being this, the, or an evil fiction, this Muhammad of the Hadith for centuries. And what, is, what does Islam say about the wrong sect, and is the correct way something you might have overlooked? Okay, so you should, the alternative is you need to leave bad tradition. It's not enough to believe the right stuff. You also have to uh, not believe the, 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 the really wrong stuff. Don't place your love and your loyalty with any tradition. Seek only God. Even Muslims have respect for the Torah and the Bible, though few have read them. Why not read the Gospels and, and, and see how different the teaching of Jesus is? And we'd invite you to do so and to contact us, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. That's right. And, uh, you know, we still have uh, probably about eight or nine minutes left in the show. And, and uh, you know, with all this information and the questions to ask of our, our, our viewers, particularly the Muslim viewers, they have a question to ask themselves, besides all these questions you asked, which are perfectly valid, is uh, the question of whether you say Muhammad did have sex with a nine-year-old girl or he didn't have sex with a nine-year-old girl. It, you've got the problem of, well, if he didn't, then you've got to deny the Hadith, and if you deny the Hadith, then it goes back in all those questions you're asking, and then you've got problems that way, and at the same time, uh, are you in the right sect? If, if you're denying the Hadith, then that means you must be in a different sect of Islam. But how do you know that sect of Islam is correct? And by what standard of authority do you, do you go with on uh, determining these things? If, if, let's say, you're a Muslim, do I throw out the Hadith and just stick with the Quran? Mm -hmm. And do I just believe the Quran? But then in Islamic countries, how do you uh, establish... A cultural law without the hadith. How do you? Uh, how do you use conservative just... Muslims have have said in writing that I read that basically you cannot without the hadith to interpret the Quran and say, well, when was this written? What does this mean? So, so if you're just a a a a, a Muslim that wants to just stick to the Quran only, let's look at it this way, and you're going to say, okay, I don't want anything to do with this 53, 53 year old man having sex with a little nine year old girl and marrying her when she's six, mm -hmm. like all these Hadiths say, I don't want anything to do with that. And as you said, some people accept it gladly in Islam, but probably a lot of the ones you're talking about wouldn't. Uh, so what I want to do is just stick with the Quran and just go with what the Quran says and leave out the Hadiths. Now, 
how as a Muslim uh, trying to follow just the Quran are you going to be able to live your life and do the things while you exclude all the Hadith? Well, it, it, well, one problem with excluding the Hadith is, you, is, is not that they had a few little mistakes, but you're saying that the whole thing is, is so unreliable. Basically, it's like all of the early Muslims were liars or, 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 or made up or, or, or Right, made because the minute stories. you say that, you're now destroying the credibility of all the, the, the so-called, as you say, writers and witnesses to Muhammad that supposedly said all these testimonies. Right, right, about right, right. and then Muhammad changes from being a historically documented guy to this man of history, almost like, you know, did, you know, did he almost really even live? Because you have no um, reputable uh, 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 record of anything he did beside the Quran, if, that is, if you throw out everything in history about him. Now, as a, as a Muslim trying to just stick to the Quran only and nothing else, how then is he going to uh, uh, follow the, the rules of the Quran uh, without all these other things? Because there's so many things in the Quran that are not explained. Uh, you'd have to have the hadith to even help you understand some of the well, things what, the what, 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 Well, not only that, but there are many things in the Quran that are abrogated, meaning an earlier one, like, like the, uh, some verses of the Quran are, are fairly peaceful about coexisting with Christians and Jews. Right. And then you and, have Surah 9. It, right, right, right. And, and <laughs> now the trouble is, is that the later thing abrogates the earlier part, and Surah 9 is one of the last surahs that was written in the Quran, and it's the most warlike with all the what are called sword verses. Okay, just as an example, uh, Surah 9 talks about what killing, uh, the, killing the pagans or slaying them wherever you find them. Right. Uh, all these warlike uh, references, and this is probably one of the uh, uh, the great uh, 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 in, uh, the energizers, you might say, of terrorists. Yeah. The, they use like Surah 9 out of the Quran to motivate them to go out and be suicide bombers and and you know attack anything that they consider to be non-Islamic mm -hmm. and things like this and declaring jihads and holy wars so they can go to heaven and have these 70 women uh, you know in, in sex and paradise and all this type of stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. The, the 70 women, 70, 73, they, see that's all Hadith thing. Ah, so... Here they, again, they, they, the they, Quran they, doesn't even explain that. It, 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 it mentions uh, maidens in heaven that they'll have. It doesn't give any number, though. It doesn't say many details. Ah, uh, so, uh, so, so you got to sort of like follow the Hadith, Hadith to fill be in a, the blank. Yeah, you got to follow something of Hadith to be a suicide bomber. So a Muslim is trying to say, well, you know, these Hadiths, they're just, they're just too unreliable. They're just showing me too many terrible things, like how it's all right to strip women, mm -hmm. uh, have sex with women, uh, take a married woman and have sex with her, even though her husband's, you know, if she's she, still if married she, to If she's a them. captive, right. Right, a captive, and all these things we've documented in other shows. Uh, and they just don't want any of that. Doesn't it really come down to a, a Muslim having to take the Quran by itself and just have faith in this book and try to... Eliminate other minds, all all this other information that's the, out there. All, all the contrary, you know, don't confuse with facts. Right, and and then then you've got the problem with the Quran itself, with having contradictions within itself. Right, contradictions with the Bible on all fronts. Right, you know, the, the Quran sun going down in a muddy spring. Right, right. The the Quran saying that Jesus is not the Son of God. Say not that Allah has a son. Right, uh, you know, denying that uh, the Trinity, for instance, in the in in the Scripture, denying all types of uh, biblical doctrine that were there hundreds of years before the Quran even came to existence. And the very uh, formation of the Quran is itself suspect, just like the Hadiths are. Yeah, well, well, one thing that would clear up a lot of things about the variants in the Quran is that uh, Hafsa, one of the wives of Muhammad, uh, according, uh, I read it from the book, the Bible, the, the Quran and the Bible in the Light of yeah, History and Science, um, she... Uh, was she could read and write, and she kept a copy of the Quran, okay? And so being wife of Muhammad, she probably had a pretty good copy there. Uh -huh. Anyway, after the, the, the Quran was standardized, uh, uh, Uthman de demanded her copy of the Quran, and she didn't give it, but, but after him, uh, her copy was, was uh, confiscated, and her copy was burned. Right. So, now, uh, give a reference to this book real quick for okay. my viewers. The, the, uh, uh, I've read a, a number of uh, 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 I've read a number of books uh, by Christians on, on the Quran and, and, and problems with it and problems with Islam. This is one of the better ones I've read by Dr. William Campbell, 
Uh, he's, uh, sp he's a Christian who speaks Arabic. He's been in Arab lands. Um, he uh, is a, also a medical doctor, and he writes in some of the bogus medical claims in, in the Quran, as well as variants in it, as, as well as what other books do too, well, you know, the contradictions in the Quran and things like that. But he has a very readable style because, you know, he writes as someone who's talked for decades with Muslims um, and, you know, and, and, and what they would understand and how we have to break through their misunderstanding of stuff. Right. So it, it documents a lot of uh, problems within the Quran itself, scientifically uh, and, and other facts. And so uh, books like this, and there's many other good references as well, but mm. see, a person who wants to just stick with the Quran then suddenly has to deal with other problems that relate with the problems of the Hadith. Right. So suddenly... Uh, just the formation of the Quran starts to have a, a sinister patterns in relationships to the way the Hadiths were formed. Yeah, it, it, well, well, it's not just the formation of the Quran, but we could call it maybe the reformation or standardization right, under right. Uthman, when, and, when surahs were left out, added. Exactly, uh, the abrogation of uh, things. Or, well, well, anyway. no, 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 abrogation, it's still there, but it's not followed. Uh, surahs are left out. Sahih Muslim documents this, and you can read this on our website, www.muslimhope.com. Uh, all documented from the Hadith. That's right. Now, Steve, we've got less than a minute to go here, and so I'm going to have to sign off for now. But uh, for our viewers out there, we have we have uh, free literature on this subject. We have you know newsletters, tracts, information. We have a, a big resource list of all our videos and audio cassettes, CDs, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so please contact our ministry with the phone number, our, our email address, our written ad, uh, the address at the end. Uh, we're more than glad to help you with these things. Uh, the, the Bible, though, stands uh, it has verifiable archaeological evidence, uh, uh, 2,000 fulfilled prophecies showing its supernatural nature, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is diametrically opposed to all this. Everything's consistent. Dead Sea Scrolls verify it. It's amazing, the contrast between the Quran, the Hadith, and the Word of God, the Bible. Remember, Jesus says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. So it's Christ you should put your trust in, the Word of God, which is far vastly superior to a man who had sex with a nine-year-old girl. So with that, I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, with our Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here. Thanks. Contact us if you need more information. God bless you all. Turn back from the innovations of Muhammad uh, and the Hadith and to what God really said in the Bible. God did not fool all his followers with false teaching for centuries. Jesus' death was not a defeat, but the means by which Jesus uh, went forth in battle and defeated Satan in his own realm. After Jesus conquered, Jesus was physically raised from the dead as a sign of God. You can no longer ignore Jesus' words. He taught that he was no mere prophet. There is only one God, but Jesus is a distinct part of the inseparable God. Call on Jesus as your Lord, worship him as the apostles and his other followers did, and accept his forgiveness for sins.
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 